Darwin's Doubt, Part 3. We have been going through the book Darwin's Doubt, written by uh, Stephen C. Meyer, um, author of Signature in the Cell, uh, got his master's in geology and was d doing uh, geophysics for the oil industry when he got interested in the origin of life and um, uh, then went and got his PhD from Cambridge in the philosophy of science and um, is currently the director for the Center for Science and Culture at the Discovery Institute. Uh, the book, in fact, is a massive expansion of Meyer's uh, article that gave so much trouble to um, the establishment to the point where they actually retracted the article in spite of not being able to show any uh, any uh, wrongdoing in, in in its publication because it's just much easier if such articles don't exist. That's what the cover of the book looks like. The book is divided into three main parts according to the prologue. These are uh, uh, Meyer's own words. Part one, the mystery of the missing fossils, and he goes on to explain a little bit about that. Part two, how to build an animal, which has to do with the requirement for information. And part three, after Darwin, what, which goes into what do you do if you give up Darwin? And uh, the story so far is uh, we've discussed the sudden appearance of multiple life forms in the Cambrian, which was a major unsolved problem for Darwin, and the problem's only gotten worse with time. And the discovery of the Burgess Shale first, and then the changing fossils in China. The excuse that the precursors were soft-bodied and therefore not preserved has been refuted by two types of evidence. One, we have soft-bodied creatures in the uh, Cambrian, and two, we have soft-bodied creatures in the Precambrian that have been preserved, just not the ones that are supposed to be there according to standard evolutionary theory. And uh, chapter four begins with um, a, a little tenseness to set up the um, the uh, claim that in fact there are fossils that aren't are there that should be there that show how the ancestry went. And he says the atmosphere in the auditorium of the Sam Noble Science Museum at the University of Oklahoma was uncomfortably tense with a security detail of local Norman, Oklahoma police officers on hand to keep the peace. Conspicuous change from the campus security guard who might be present as a typical university event. The occasion, a new documentary, Darwin's Dilemma, that Jonathan Wells, a colleague of mine from the Discovery Institute, and I were scheduled to show. Jonathan Wells, a biologist well known for his skepticism about contemporary Darwinian theory, attended the pre-film lecture. Again, this is a Reader's Digest version. You can um, read the full version in the book itself. The paleontologist from the university argued that the Cambrian explosion presented no actual dilemma for Darwinian evolution in a lecture that was given before their lecture, and, or, pardon me, their film, and then a question and answer series. This particular paleontologist also denied that novel animal forms emerged suddenly in the Cambrian. Instead, he argued that they arose in rudimentary form much early in the late Precambrian. He noted that paleontologists had discovered in the late Precambrian sediments fossilized sponges, a type of primitive mollusk, and the burrows of worms. He also laid particular stress on the significance of a group of enigmatic organisms first discovered in the Ediacaran Hills in southern Australia, dating from about 565 million years ago, in a Precambrian period known as the Vendian or Ediacaran. Jonathan and I were well aware that most paleontologists do not regard these fossilized organisms as plausible ancestors of the Cambrian fauna. But on that evening, the expert from the university claimed the opposite. 
He also claimed that some obscure Ediacaran organisms with exotic names such as Vernanomacula, or Vernanomacula, which we've talked about here before, uh, Parvincorina, and Arcarua, represented early bilater bilaterians, or bilaterally symmetrical animals, arthropods, and echinoderms. He insisted that these organisms pushed back the explosion of animal life by some 40 million years, establishing a fuse for the Cambrian explosion in the forms of primitive and presumably ancestral animal forms for several of the most significant Cambrian phyla and body designs. An hour before I was to walk over to lead a discussion and answer questions about the Cambrian films from what proved to be an intensely hostile audience, Jonathan Wells called me with a report on the museum's attempt to refute the film preemptively. The presentation claimed to have resolved the Cambrian mystery, Darwin's dilemma, by showing that the ancestral precursors to the major groups of Cambrian animals had been found after all. But, Stephen Meyer asks, is this true? And again, we're skipping over a few things. In public presentations about the Cambrian explosion, I've often encountered this claim, though usually in the form of an unfocused question. What about the Ediacaran? Nevertheless, in writing about the Cambrian, I take care not to attribute the idea that the Ediacaran fauna represent Cambrian ancestors to leading Ediacaran or Cambrian experts, lest I critique a straw man. In other words, they don't believe it. Most paleontologists doubt that well-known Ediacaran forms represent ancestors of the Cambrian animals, and few think the late Precambrian fossil record as a whole makes the Cambrian explosion appreciably less explosive. The claim is important to address, however, since it persists as a kind of paleontological urban legend, one that even occasionally finds its way into the mouths of paleontologists. I might add, particularly when they're trying desperately to defend Darwinism against the obvious implications of the Cambrian explosion. The Ediacaran fauna derive their name from their most notable discovery site, the Ediacaran Hills in the outback of southeastern Australia. These fauna date from late Precambrian time, a period that the International Union of Geological Sciences has recently renamed the Ediacaran period. Since geologists used to call the last period of Precambrian time the Vendian period, paleontologists also refer to the Ediacaran fauna as the Vendian fauna or biota. Those are synonymous names. Vendian came first and then Ediacaran afterwards, and figure one six is just his drawing of the geologic timetable, and you can see the Ediacaran period ended just before the Cambrian period not just before the Cambrian explosion, which came a few million years into the Cambrian period, but uh, just before the beginning of the Cambrian itself in the standard geological time scale. Although these fossils were originally dated to between 700 and 640 million years old, volcanic ash beds below, both below and above the Namibian site, so they found them in Australia, and now they found them in southern Africa, south western Africa. Um, <coughs> have recently provided more accurate radiometric dates. These studies fix the date for the first appearance of the Ediacaran fauna at about 570 to 565 million years ago and the last appearance at the Cambrian boundary at about 543 million years. In other words, they went extinct during the Cambrian, at least as far as we can tell, or about 13 million years before the onset of the Cambrian explosion itself. So it's actually this uh, 13 million year by conventional chronology time gap between the last of the Ediacaran fauna and the first of the Cambrian. The late Precambrian era sediments around the world have yielded four main types of fossils, all of which are dated between about 570 and 543 million years ago. The first group consists of the Precambrian sponges mentioned in the previous chapter. These animals first arose 
about 570 to 565 million years ago, that the sponges. Then the second is the distinctive group of fossils from the Ediacaran Hills. The creatures fossilized there include such well-known forms as the flat, air mattress-like body of Dickinsonia, the enigmatic Sprengina, with its long, elongated and segmented body and possible head shield, although the segments are kind of strange. They're offset from each other like herringbone instead of being matching like typical bilateral animals. And the frond-like charnia, and we're going to see figure 4.1 next. These organisms were at least mostly soft-bodied and are large enough to identify with the naked eye. And there's a drawing of Dickinsonia here with the actual fossil here. There's a drawing of Springina and the actual fossil here. You'll notice that you see these things are offset a half a step instead of being perfectly matched. And the same thing is true of Charnia, whatever Charnia is. The third group includes what are called trace fossils, the possible remains of animal activity such as tracks, burrows, and fecal pellets. Some paleontologists have attributed these trace fossils to ancient worms. The fourth group is the fossils of what may be primitive mollusks, a possibility that received support from a recent discovery in the cliffs along the White Sea in northwestern Russia. There, Russian scientists have discovered 35 distinctive specimens of a possible mollusk called Kimberella, probably a simple animal form. These new white sea specimens, dated to 50, 550 million years ago, suggest that Kimberella had a strong, though not hard, limpet-like shell, crept along the seafloor, and resembled a mollusk. And that should be reference number three. Um, paleontologist Douglas Irwin of the Smithsonian Institution has commented, it's the first animal that you can convincingly demonstrate is more complicated than a flatworm. And now you see how three should have looked. That's my mistake for not redoing that after bringing the, the text over. Additionally, seafloor tracks from Precambrian sediments in both Canada and Australia have been attributed to mollusks since the tracks resembled what might have been left by a row of small teeth on the tongue like ribbon of some mollusks as they scraped food particles off the seafloor. In this case, Kimberella may well be, may well have been the track maker. Then uh, he's coming back to reevaluating these things. First, with the exception of sponges and the possible exception of Kimberella, the body plans of visibly fossilized organisms, as opposed to trace fossils, bear no clear relationship to any of the organisms that appear in the Cambrian explosion or thereafter. The most noted Ediacaran organisms, such as Dickinsonia, Springina, and Charnia, do not have an obvious head, a mouth, bilateral symmetry, a gut, or sense organs, such as eyes. Some paleontologists question whether these organisms even belong in the animal kingdom. Dickinsonia, for example, has been interpreted by University of Oregon paleontologist uh, Gregory Ritalic as having fungal lichen affinities, since its mode of fossil preservation is comparable not with that of soft bodied jellyfish or worms and snidarians. Uh, it's hydra, things like that, but with the fossil record of fungi and lichens. Dickinsonia's taxonomic position, Ritalic notes, has long been an unsolved puzzle. Biological affinities of Dickinsonia remain problematic, he writes, since it has been variously considered a polychaete tubularian or annelid worm, jellyfish, polyp, xenophytophoran protist, lichen, or mushroom. So you can do whatever you want to with that. Similar disputes have characterized attempts to classify Springina. In 1976, Martin Glessner, the first paleontologist to study the Ediacaran in detail described Springina as a possible annelid polychaete worm based largely upon its segmented body. 
Nevertheless, Simon Conway Morris later rejected that hypothesis because Springina shows no evidence of the distinguishing chaits, leg-like bristled protrusions that polychaete worms possess. Glasner himself later reputed, repudiated his original hypothesis that Springina was ancestral to polychaetes, noting that Springina cannot be considered as a primitive polychaete having, a, having none of the possible ancestral characters indicated by specialists on the systematics and evolution of this group. So basically, it was proposed and it was retracted by the proposer and uh, rejected by other experts in the field. And I say other experts because remember these are both uh, peer-reviewed articles, which means that uh, somebody else thought that Simon Conway Morris's objections were reasonable ones. In 1981, paleontologist Sven Jorgen Burkett Smith produced a reconstruction of a Sprungina fossil showing that it possessed a head and legs similar to those of trilobites, though examinations of subsequent Sprungina specimens have shown no evidence that it possessed limbs of any kind. So you can call it a trilobite if you reconstruct it this way, but of course the reconstruction doesn't match the fossils. Oh well. Paleontologists James Valentine, Douglas Irwin, and J David Jablonski distill the confusing welter of conflicting, evident, uh, conflicting views about the Ediacaran fossils. Although the soft-bodied fossils that appear about 565 million years ago are animal-like, their classifications are hotly debated. In just the past few years, these fossils have been viewed as protozoans, as lichens, as close relatives of the Cnidarians, as a sister group to Cnidarians plus all other animals, as representatives of more advanced extinct phyla, and as representatives of a new kingdom entirely separate from the animals. People have said all kinds of things. Although many paleontologists initially showed interest in the possibility that the Cambrian animals forms might have evolved from the Ediacaran organisms, paleontologist Peter Ward who, by the way, is no friend of intelligent design, explains that later study cast doubt on the affinity between these ancient remains preserved in sandstones, the Australian Ediacaran, and living creatures of today. So the current belief is, nah, I don't think so. As Nature recently noted, if the Ediacaran fauna were animals, they bore little or no resemblance to any other creatures, either fossil or extant. This absence of clear affinities has led to an increasing number of paleontologists to reject ancestor-descendant relationships between all, but at most a few, of the Ediacaran and Cambrian fauna. Nevertheless, some have suggested that trace fossils may establish a link. So let's forget the Ediacaran stuff, but maybe it's the little things that look like they could be burrows or tracks or something like that. Or maybe poop from one of these things. In an authoritative 2011 paper in the journal Science, Douglas Irwin and colleagues described the discovery of Ediacaran trace fossils consisting of surface tracks, burrows, fecal pellets, and feeding trails, which, they argue, though small, could only have been made by animals such as worms with a relatively high degree of complexity. On the basis of these findings, Erwin and other paleontologists have argued that these trace fossils suggest the existence of organisms with a head and tail, nervous systems, a muscular body wall, allowing creeping or burrowing, and a gut with mouth and anus. Now, of course, for people who are looking at the Cambrian explosion as something happening in real time, um, you're kind of stuck with that. For a creationist, if it happened, it wouldn't be a big deal, short age creationist, because we expect to have worms before the very bottom layer that's laid down by the flood. So, you know, I'd have some sympathy with them if uh, they made that claim. Graham Budd, and a British paleontologist who works at Uppsala University in Sweden and others have disputed these associations. Bud and geologist colleague Soren, 
Uh, is that Soren Jensen? No, nobody hears Swedish. Actually, that's Jensen would be Danish, wouldn't it? Um, argue that many alleged trace fossils actually show evidence of inorganic origin. There are numerous reports of older trace fossils, but most can be immediately shown to represent either inorganic sedimentary structures or metaphytes, or land plants in other words, or alternatively, they have been misdated. So they're saying uh, they're not sure. Still others have suggested that surface tracks and trails could have been left by mobile single-celled organisms, including a known form of a giant deep sea protist that leaves bilaterian-like impressions. Sometime we ought to explore that particular interesting creature. As one paper explains, some such traces date back to 1.5 billion to 1.8 billion years ago, which outdates even the boldest claims of the time of origin of animal multicellularity and forces researchers to contemplate the possibility of an inorganic or bacterial origin. In other words, okay, if you're going to call those worm tracks, then you've got to call these worm tracks, and you've got to call these worm tracks. Uh, 1.8 billion years? I don't think so. Even the most favorable interpretations of these trace fossils suggest that they indicate the presence of no more than two animal body plants of largely unknown characteristics. Thus, the Ediacaran record falls far short of establishing the, identify, identi establishing the existence of the wide variety of transitional intermediates that a Darwinian view of life's history requires. The Cambrian explosion attests to the first appearance of organisms representing at least 20 phyla. You got 20 phyla, you got to have organisms leading up to each one of those. And many more subphyla and classes, each manifesting distinctive body plans. And probably each leaving distinctive tracks. Third, even if representatives of four animal phyla were present in the Ediacaran period, it does not follow that these forms were necessarily transitional or intermediate to the Cambrian animals. The Precambrian sponges, phylum periphera, for example, were quite similar to the Cambrian brethren thus demonstrating not a gradual transformation from a simple, simpler precursor or the presence of an ancestor common to many forms, but quite possibly only an earlier first appearance of a known Cambrian form. The same may be true of whatever kind of worm may be tested by the Precambrian tracks and burrows. If it was a fully formed worm, then all we've done is, is move the worm back further. We haven't shown how it came from a three-quarter worm, which came from a half worm, which came from a one quarter worm, which came from an algae or something. The Ediacaran fossils themselves provide evidence of a puzzling leap into biological complexity, though not one nearly great enough or of the right kind to account for the Cambrian explosion. So this is a mini explosion. Before organisms like Kimberella, Dickinsonia, and sponges appeared, the only living forms documented in the fossil record for over three billion years were single-celled organisms and colonial algae. That's all you had. Producing sponges, worms, and mollusks from single-celled organisms is a little like transforming a spinning top into a bicycle. The bicycle isn't remotely as complex as the automobile sitting beside it, but it represents an enormous leap in technological sophistication over the spinning top. Likewise, although the humble Ediacaran biota looks simple beside most of the Cambrian animals, they represent an enormous leap in functional complexity over the single-celled organisms and colonial algae that preceded them. The Ediacaran fossils, therefore, do not solve the problem of the sudden increase in biological form and complexity during the Cambrian. Instead, they represent an earlier, if less dramatic, manifestation of the same kind of problem. To biology's Big Bang, the Ediacaran biota add a significant POW. As paleobiologist Kevin Peterson of Dartmouth College and his colleagues note, these fauna represent an apparent quantum leap in ecological complexity as compared with the boring billions of years 
that characterize Earth before the Ediacaran. Even if these organisms are still relatively simple when compared with the Cambrian, which they characterize as another quantum leap in organizational and then ecological complexity. Like classical Darwinism, the neo-Darwinian mechanism requires great stretches of time to produce novel biological form and structure. Yet current studies in geochronology suggest that only 40 to 50 million years elapsed between the beginning of the Ediacaran radiation, 570 to 565 million years ago, and the end of the Cambrian explosion, 525 to 520 million years ago. So if you take, let's say, uh, the 57520, the maximum is about 40 or uh, 50 million years. To anyone unfamiliar with the equations of population genetics by which neo-Darwinian neo evolutionary biologists estimate how much morphological change is likely to occur in a given period of time, 40 to 50 million years may seem like an eternity. But when empirically derived estimates of the rate at which mutations accumulate imply that 40 to 50 million years does not constitute anything like enough time to build the necessary anatomical novelties that will arise in the Cambrian period and in the Ediacaran periods. I will describe this problem in more detail in chapter 12. In fact, I think it's probably uh, safe to argue that 500 million years is not enough time for this kind of stuff to happen. Until recently, radiometric studies had estimated the duration of the Cambrian radiation itself, that's Cambrian explosion, at 40 million years. In other words, it over a 40 million years period of time this had happened. A period of time so brief geologically speaking that even back then paleontologists had already dubbed it an explosion. Thus treating the Ediacaran and the Cambrian radiations as one continuous evolutionary event, itself an unrealistically generous assumption, only returns the problem to its earlier pre-zircon dating status. They're getting hammered here by radiometric dating. In his talk before showing of our film, the local professor from the University of Oklahoma asserted that the rather indistinct fossil form found in the Ediacaran Hills, called Parvan Corina, represented a plausible ancestor to the arthropods. We're going to see in just a minute a, a picture of that. Some have described Parvan Corina as a shield-shaped fossil form with a raised anchor-shaped ridge impressed atop it bearing a superficial resemblance in its shape to that of a trilobite, thus the claim that it might have been represented an early arthropod. Yet leading Cambrian paleontologists dispute this association. Cambrian expert James Valentine has argued that Parvan Carina is not convincing as an arthropod ancestor, and for good reason. Parvan Carina lacked fossils lacked a head, jointed limbs, and compound eyes all distinctive features of arthropods. So if it was a, arthro a pre-trilobite, it didn't have the eyes, it didn't have the jointed limbs, it didn't have the head. Thus, Valentine noted that Parvin Carina fossils have not been shown to share derived features with arthropods. And on the right is Parvin Carina. And you'll notice that if, where you'd expect the head, it's just simply missing. And there really aren't any legs, and there really, you know, it's an, kind of a not very distinct fossil, but uh, what you do see there is not very clear. This, by the way, is Archaeota, which is, um, uh, pardon me, Arc, Archaeota, which is a, um, um, if you look there, you can kind of vaguely see a kind of a star shape. If you try real hard, you can kind of make this into a sand dollar or something like that. Valentine makes much of the same point about the smaller disc-like imprint called Arcaru, one of the other Ediacaran forms cited by the University of Oklahoma professor that night at the Sam Noble Museum. Valentine points out that it, too, lacks many distinctive features of the animal phylum to which it is typically assigned. Indeed, those who propose Arcarua as an ancestor to the Cambrian animals usually claim 
that it represents an early echinoderm, as the professor in Oklahoma did. Some have perceived five tiny segmented divisions within the circular impressions left by Akarua, making them seem roughly similar to some modern echinoderms. But that similarity has proven superficial at best. Other paleontologists observe that Arcarua lacks a stereome or water vascular system, the tube feet that are typical for starfish and all of their relatives. A definitive diagnostic feature of echinoderms. Thus, its echinoderm specific features are not readily visible. Valentine has argued that, absent such telltale features, the relationship to Arc of Arcarua to echinoderms remains uncertain. In the case of Vernanomacula, the story is more complicated, but equally problematic. Vernanomacula is the name that Chinese paleontologists gave to an imprint in phosphorite sediments found in the Duchanto formation in 2004. Some of you may remember we talked about this uh, a couple months ago. Making the impression even older than the Ediacaran strata, the paleontologist David Botcher of the University of Southern California and some Chinese paleontologists, at least initially, suspected that the Vernanomalcula imprint might be the remains of an early bilaterian. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, some of you may remember seeing this in uh, color rather than black and white. Um, though the paper was entitled A Merciful Death for the Earliest Bilaterian, Vernon and Malkila, the authors of this particular paper, which kind of seems to have closed the door on this discussion, were anything but merciful in wielding their arguments. Their article upbraided David J. Botcher, the main paleontologist who has promoted the interpretation of Vernon and Malkula as a bilaterian ancestor, for seeing what he wanted to see and disregarding the clear evidence of non-biological mineralization. In a 2005 Scientific American article, Botcher interpreted Vernon and Malkula as the oldest fossil with a bilaterian body plan yet discovered. In that article, Botcher claimed that Vernanomalcula confirmed the suspicion that complex animals have a much deeper root in time, and that the Cambrian was less of an explosion and more of a flowering of animal life. In other words, when he went there, he thought that there ought to be some animals there, and he ought to be able to find balatarian animals, and that's what he was looking for. And as to quote, uh, Bengston et al. in the kind of money paragraph. It is likely that the fossils referred to as Vernanomalcular were interpreted as bilaterians because this was, the ellipses are uh, Steve Myers, the explicit query of its authors. If you know from the beginning not only what you are looking for, but what you are going to find, you will find it, whether it exists, whether or not it exists. As Richard Feynman, 1974, famously remarked, the first principle is that you must not fool yourself, and you are the easiest person to fool. Um, the sermon this morning, I think, is apropos here. Once you have fooled yourself, you will fool other scientists. Uh, and then, Steve Meyer gets into what he calls a deeper problem. Though back in 2009, Jonathan Wells and I didn't know about the most recent critical analysis of Vernon and Malcula's pretensions, we did know that many leading paleontologists had rejected attempts to identify Vernon and Malcula as an animal form. Thus, during the question and answer period following the film, Jonathan Wells explained why these and other obscure and enigmatic Precambrian fossils or imprints failed to qualify as convincing precursors to any of the Cambrian animals, citing the work of leading authorities in paleontology, pretty much like what he's doing in the book here. I recognized a deeper problem with attempts to resolve the mystery of the Cambrian explosion by pointing out to a few Precambrian fossils. 
Many defenders of the Darwinian picture of the history of life seem to assume that the discovery of any alleged Precambrian animal forms, however implausible as ancestors of specific Cambrian animals or however sparsely distributed in the vast sequences of Precambrian strata, would solve the mystery of the Cambrian explosion. That's, I think, what you call confirmation bias. To see what's wrong with this way of thinking, imagine an ambitious distant swimmer claiming that it would be possible to swim between California and Hawaii over a period of many months or years because of the small islands that provide way stations where he could eat, rest, and overnight at each stage along his marathon journey. But instead of showing that an archipelago dotting the route between California and Hawaii at reasonably accessible intervals actually exists, which is comparable, of course, to the fossils that are three quarters and uh, seven eighths and three quarters and five eighths and so forth and on down for chordates, for, for uh, uh, arthropods, for starfish, for various other creatures that are found in the Precambrian. Um, he points to a couple of barren atolls in the South Pacific, far from the most likely course to Hawaii. Clearly, in that case, the claims of our intrepid hypothetical swimmer would not be critical, uh, credible. You know, even if he could point to atolls that went around towards the back of Hawaii, you might be able to survive, but you need, you need a whole bunch of them, and they're preferably they're in, in line. To appreciate another aspect of this problem, let's revisit the claims about Vernanomalcula as a possible ancestor to, of all the bilaterian phyla. On the one hand, for such a form to qualify as the ancestor common to a large number of specific phyla, such as the many bilaterian phyla that arise in the Cambrian. Bilaterian is simply symmetrical bilaterally, like we are with two arms, two legs, more or less every, everything in line. Um, you're allowed to have the heart on one side uh, and the liver on the other side, but, uh, but for the outside of the body, it's pretty, pretty well symmetrical. Um, and that's true for insects as well as for people. For form to qualify for all this stuff, it must exhibit the basic bilateral characteristics such as bilateral symmetry and what is called a triploblasty, that is the pres presence of three distinct tissue layers, endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. Those of you who took uh, uh, embryology will probably remember those. At the same time, a viable candidate for the role of common ancestor cannot by definition manifest any of the differentiating characteristics that differenti distinguish the individual Cambrian phyla and their respective body plans from each other. For example, any bilaterian that manifests the characteristic exoskeletons of, say, an arthropod cannot also qualify as a plausible ancestor of a chordate because chordates have internal skeletons or notochords. The logic of these distinct body plan designs preclude sharing both anatomical characteristics. For this reason, any hypothetical bilateral common ancestor could only have existed as a kind of lowest anatomical common denominator, or what evolutionary biologists call a ground plan, having only those few features that are common to all of the animal forms that allegedly evolved from it. But this creates a dilemma. If a fossilized form is simple enough to qualify as a common ancestor of later highly differentiated bilateral phyla, then it will necessarily lack most of the important distinguishing anatomical features of this specific phyla. This means that all of the interesting anatomical novelties that differentiate one phylum from another must arise from separate lineages branching out from the alleged common ancestor well, before, well after its origin in the fossil record. Heads, jointed limbs, compound eyes, guts, anuses, antennae, notochords, stereomes, lobo lobophores, a tentacle feeding organism that um, is in brachiopods um, and is in them today. We do have brachiopods nowadays. And numerous other distinguishing characteristics of many different animals must come later on many distinct lines of descent. 
Yet the gradual evolutionary origin of those characteristics is not documented in the Precambrian fossil record. These characteristics do not appear until they arise suddenly in the Cambrian explosion. Just come out of nowhere. This paradox is well known to paleontologists who work in the Cambrian radiation. Charles Marshall and James Valentine, for instance, describe the difficulty of attempting to characterize an undiagnostic group by which they mean a possible ancestral stem group that lacks the specialized characteristics of its presumptive evolutionary progeny. They write, when trying to unravel the origins of the animal phyla, the hardest to examine is the phase between the actual cladogenic origin of a phylum and the time that it acquired its first phylum specific characteristics. Even if we have fossils from this phase of a phylum's history, we will not be able to prove their kinships at the level of phyla. It's a difficult problem and you need lots and lots of different kinds of fossils in order to solve it, which we don't have. During the question and answer session that followed the screening of Darwin's dilemma, none of the University of Oklahoma PhD students or science faculty who attended the museum sponsored lecture challenged my colleague Jonathan Wells when he explained why leading paleontologists do not think the ex exotic Precambrian forms cited in the lecture were ancestors of ca Cambrian forms. The guy made this wonderful speech about how they're related, and then in the question and answer period after Jonathan Wells says they're not related, nobody says, but didn't Professor so-and-so say they're related? It's odd, no? This non-reaction seemed a little odd given the stress of the museum's own expert had laid on those claims. And had given that he had made of these claims rather emphatically in the same building to many of the same people just three hours earlier. But that's not the weirdest part. On our flight out of town the next day, Jonathan Wells told me something that cast our experience in it there in an even odder light. He'd had a chance to walk around the Sam Noble Science Museum after the lecture and before our event with the lecture ringing in his ears, oh, this is how it happened, and here's all these intermediate forms. He discovered that the museum had a display that vividly illustrates the severity of what we call Darwin's dilemma, and didn't talk about all these intermediate animals. Hmm, strange. And uh, there's a few more paragraphs that go into that in a little more detail. But I'm going to skip on to the genes tell the story now. And um, he starts out with saying reconstructing the history of life has a lot in common with detective work and explains that a little bit and then calls Richard Dawkins to witness. I have used the metaphor of a detective coming on the scene after the crime of the crime after it is all over and reconstructing from the surviving clues what must have happened. So this is pretty standard stuff. But he goes on, but as evolutionary biologists and paleontologists have come to realize that the Great Cambrian fossil record has not furnished the confirmation that Darwin hoped it would. Many have looked to other kinds of clues to establish the gradual emergence of Cambrian animal life from a common ancestor. In this effort, contemporary evolutionary biologists have followed the example of Darwin himself. He was acutely aware that the discontinuity of the fossil record, particularly as evidenced in Precambrian and Cambrian strata, did not and uh, mesh nicely with his theory is brought from above so you understand what the reference is. This is why he emphasized other types of evidence to establish his theory of universal common descent. So basically ignored that and went on to something that was a little easier to mesh with his theory. In a famous chapter in On the Origin of Species, and that should be italicized and I missed that, entitled The Mutual Affinities of Organic Beings, Darwin made his case not on the basis of the fossil evidence, but on the basis of similar anatomical structures in many organisms, many distinct organisms. He noted, for example, that four limbs of frogs, horses, bats, humans, and many other vertebrates exhibit a common five-digit pentadactyl structure or organization. And we're getting to five, it's figure 5.1, which I'm sure all of you who have taken biology have seen this picture or something very like it before. To explain such homologies, as he called them, Darwin posited a vertebrate ancestor that possessed 
pentadactyl limbs in rudimentary form. As the menagerie of modern vertebrates evolved from this common ancestor, each retained in its own way the basic pentadactyl mode of organization. For Darwin, his theory of descent with modification from a common ancestor explained these similarities better than the received view of many older 19th century biologists such as Louis Agassiz, we saw him in chapter one, or Richard Owen, both of whom thought homologies reflected the common design plan of a creative intelligence. He likes five fingers for some reason. And you can see this is a bat, one, two, three, four, five fingers. Porpoise, one, two, three, four, five. A horse which has um, the third toe kind of magnified and everything else almost disappear, but you can see there's a couple of splint bones there that represent some of the other fingers. And then finally the human, which of course has five fingers, if you count the thumb. In reconstructing evolutionary history of life, most evolutionary biologists today emphasize the importance of homology. They assume that similarities in anatomy in the sequence of information bearing bio macromolecules such as DNA, RNA, and protein point strongly to a common ancestor. Well, if you don't have a common designer, I think that's probably true. They also assume that the degree of difference in such cases is on average proportional to the time elapsed since the divergence from a common ancestor. It takes time to do that, so uh, the more divergent they are, the more time it took. Defenders of neo-Darwinism assert that these techniques have produced a coherent evolutionary picture of the early history of animal life. They assert that clues from the realm of genetics point unequivocally to Precambrian ancestral forms and to an evolutionary history that fossils have failed to document. The molecular clock. Adv advocates of deep divergence use a method of analysis known as the molecular clock. Molecular clock studies also assume that the extent to which sequences differ in similar genes in two or more animals reflects the amount of time that has passed since those animals began to evolve from a common ancestor. A small difference means a short time, a big difference a long time. Uh, it's a good first approximation, as we shall see. Um, there are problems. In the 1990s, evolutionary biologist Gregory Ray, Jeffrey Levinson, and Leo Shapiro performed major study of Cambrian uh, relevant mole uh, molecular structures s sequence data. In 1996, they published their results in a paper entitled Molecular Evidence for Deep Precambrian Divergences Among Metazoan Phyla. And the way to skip uh, all of the methods, which again are in the book, the Ray study concluded that the common ancestor of the animal's form lived 1.2 billion years ago implying that the Cambrian animals took some 700 million years to resolve, uh, to evolve from this deep divergence point before first appearing in the fossil record. So if you believe them, you believe that there were 700 million years during which the animals were slowly developing, but no traces of the animals. More, more recently, Douglas Irwin and several colleagues performed a study comparing the degree of sequence the difference between other genes, taking a different data set. Seven nuclear housekeeping genes and three ribosomal RNA genes across 113 different species of living metazoa. The term metazoa refers to animals with a differentiated tissue. Anyway, uh, they estimated that the last common ancestor of all living animals arose nearly 800 million years ago. So this is 1.2 billion years or 800 million years. Well, take your pick. But it gets interesting. He, may, he cites a bunch of other studies that have different, different, uh, 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 different opinions. Uh, he goes on to say, in, indeed, a major aim of the Ray study was to challenge the view that the animal phyla diverged in an explosion near the beginning of the Cambrian period. In other words, he says, it can't have happened that fast. It must have had been a very long, gradual process. Keep that in mind when we get to the end. They conclude, our results cast doubt on the prevailing notion that the animal phyla is diverged explosively during the Cambrian or late Vendian, and instead suggests that there was an extended period of divergence during the mid-Proterozoic, commencing about a billion years ago. 
As we saw in chapter 3, there is no currently plausible version of the artifact hypothesis. The preservation of numerous soft-bodied Cambrian animals as well as pre-Cambrian embryos and microorganisms undermines the idea of an extensive period of undetected soft-bodied evolution. The fossils aren't there, really aren't there, and they could have been. In addition, the claim that exclusively soft-bodied ancestors preceded the hard-bodied Cambrian forms remains anatomically implausible. How does a brachiopod even function without its shell? An arthropod cannot exist without its exoskeleton. Any plausible ancestor to such organisms would have likely left some hard-body parts, yet none have been found in the Precambrian. Uh, testimony of genes, conflicting stories. There is a second, more telling reason to doubt the deep divergence hypothesis. The result of different molecular studies have generally widely di divergent results. You've heard two of them already, but you're going to hear some more, even wilder ones. Yet presumably there was only one common ancestor of all the metazoa and one ultimate divergence point. For example, comparing the race-led study and the Irwin-led study, uh, generates a difference of 400 million years. What's 400 million years among friends? In the case of the other studies, even greater divergent differences emerge. Many other studies have thrown their own wildly varying numbers into the ring, placing the common ancestor of animals anywhere between 100 million. That's not even uh, to the Cambrian. And 1.5 billion years. Well, I, I take that back. This is 100 million before the Cambrian and uh, 1.5 billion years before the Cambrian explosion, some molecular st clock studies, oddly, even place the common ancestor of the animals after the Cambrian explosion. So I was correct. There, there are some that are actually don't go f that far. In the first place, different studies of different molecules generated widely different divergent dates. In addition to the studies I have already cited, a 1997 p paper by Japanese biologist Naruo Niko and colleagues examined examine two genes, aldolase and triose phosphase isomerase, and dated the split between eumetazoa and parazoa. That's animals with tissues like cinerians from those without, like sponges, oh, um, at 940 million years. Compare that to a 1999 paper by Daniel Wong um, Sudhir Kumar and S. Blair Hedges are based on the study of 50 different genes showing that the basal animal phyla periphera cinerea stenophora diverged periphera sponges <coughs> diverged between about 1200 to 1500 million years. So same kind of differences here. Sometimes contrary, uh, contradictory divergence times are reported in the same article. The divergence between arthropods and vertebrates might be anywhere between 274 million and 1.6 billion years ago. 274 million is not out to the Cambrian. And the former date falling of almost 250 million years after the Cambrian explosion, which is, of course, ridiculous. Uh, likewise, the last common ancestor of protostomes or deuterostomes, the two broadly different types of the Cambrian explosion, corresponding for one thing between the difference between insects and, and uh, vertebrates, may have lived anywhere between 452 million and 2 billion years ago. Again, 450 million is not even to the Cambrian explosion. One study in which the authors claim to be 95% certain that the divergence date for a certain animal group falls within a 14.2 billion year range. More than three times the age of the Earth, that, that's, um, that's pretty close to the currently accepted age for the, for the Big Bang, right? And, and clearly a meaningless result. Uh, Grower and Martin, uh, observing all of this stuff, uh, wrote in Trends in Genetics, quote, uh, the, the title of their paper, Reading the Entrails of Chickens, Molecular Time Scales of Evolution and the Illusion of Precision. Uh, the title says it all. 
Unlike radiometric datings, this is choice to me, because remember our, what happened to our radiometric datings for the Triassic bird? You know, the, uh, unlike radiometric dating methods, molecular clocks depend on a host of contingent factors. As Valentin Jablonski and Irwin note, different genes in different clades evolve at different rates. Different parts of genes evolve at different rates, and most importantly, rates within clades have changed over time. So great is this variation that one paper in the journal Molecular Biology and Evolution cautions the rate of molecular evolution can vary considerably among different organisms, challenging the concept of the molecular clock. Maybe the clock itself is just so completely haywire as to not be worth paying attention to. And then he says, smuggling in Darwin, as the textbook Understanding Bioinformatics admits, the key assumption made when constructing a phylogenetic tree which of course you have to have in order to make molecular clock judgments from a set of sequences is that they are all derived from a single ancestral sequences. That is, they are all homologous. Or as the Harvard University Press textbook, The Tree of Life states, we are obliged to assume at first that for each character similar states are homologous. They derive from the common ancestor, which means you have to have common ancestry. Or by homologous, the text means characters are similar because they share a common ancestor. One could argue that the conflicting divergence points do at least show that some common ancestor exhibit existed in the Precambrian, since despite their conflicting results, all divergence studies indicate at least that. But again, to invoke molecular studies that assume the existence of a common ancestor as evidence for a common ancestor only begs the question. Certainly it provides no reason for using the molecular evidence to trump fossil evidence. We're, making, uh, we're taking molecular evidence and making assumptions about it and saying the assumptions are stronger than what we actually see in the fossil record. Uh, he goes on to talk about the shmoo, the original ur organism. And uh, I'm going to skip the rest of the chapter because I'm going to bring us back to, he is not just talking off the top of his head. Remember this quote from Dawkins, and we're going to give you the entire context, but I'm going to reverse the order of the two. Evolutionists of all stripes believe, however, that this really does represent the, this, uh, the Precambrian uh, missing fossils really does represent a very large gap in the fossil record, a gap that is simply due to the fact that for some reason very few fossils have lasted from periods before about 600 million years ago. To be precise, 540, but you know. Um, one good reason might be that many of these animals had only soft parts to their bodies, no shells or bones to fossilize. If you're a creationist, you may think that this is special pleading. Well, yes. It is special pleading because we have sponges that have soft parts to their body and that's it. We have all kinds of stuff in there that has soft parts to their body and that's it. Just we don't see these gradual things. And then to come back to what he had to say before that, he's arguing against punctuated equilibrium. For example, the Cambrian strata of rocks, vintage about 600 million years, are the oldest ones in which we fi find most of the major invertebrate groups. After we find many of them already in advanced, and we find many of them already, already in advanced state of evolution, the very first time they appear, it is as though they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. Needless to say, this appearance of sudden planting has delighted creationists. So the first paragraph, which is actually second, is saying, look, evolutionists, no evolutionist believes that this really is the way it was. Evolutionary theory demands there to be, but we don't find them, is the second or more precisely first. Um, so we all believe they're there, but we don't find them. And it brings to mind a text I read once. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. 
So they don't see them, but they believe they're there, and they hope they're there. Um, can we say they have faith? Well, I'll leave that to your comments. Pass that back. Would a good summary be maybe be that this precambering stuff you have evidences of cells or fossils or some things, but not enough to gen not enough to characterize them as the precursors to the stuff in the precambering area because they're missing too much. That's correct. And such as there are that you might claim, well, these are really um, somehow uh, very primitive organisms, so it's hard to tell. Well, they stay primitive all the way out, and then they go extinct for 13 million years, if you believe that mm -hmm. chronology. And then suddenly the new stuff comes out that's totally unrelated to them, and totally formed as well as any modern, I mean, you look at the starfish that are there, and they're starfish. <coughs> they have all the characteristics of modern starfish. The trilobites don't look like anything we have, but they do have, um, they do have obvious organization mm -hmm. to where you can judge which phylum to put them in, arthropoda. It's very clear that they're in the same phylum as shrimp and lobsters and so forth. Uh, and nowadays, we can even find fish that go back that far. So would you say that maybe creation began with the pre Precambrian era? Well, what I would, uh, the way I would interpret it, again, from a creationist, from a short age creationist point of view, you say this is probably the start of the flood. There were probably organisms before that that were every bit as complex. And that's why I don't get personally torpedoed about hearing about worms in the Precambrian, because I believe there were worms at the time of the Precambrian. Uh, just that most of them didn't actually die and get buried. The fact of the matter is fossilizing is a very difficult process. You have to kill the organism and then protect it from getting eaten by other organisms. Um, otherwise, you wind up with something totally unrecognizable. You take an entire whale and you put it down in the ocean, and in about two years, you have a hard time figuring out where it is. I'm surprised that um, he hasn't said anything about plants. Of course, I understand this deals with the Cambrian explosion, which is an animal issue. Uh, Don't we have the same kind of thing happening in um, uh, plants. angiosperms? Where well, no angiosperms, no angiosperms, no angiosperms, and all of a sudden dozens of different kinds of angiosperms? No. In general, yes, with a couple of exceptions that are really questionable. Uh, the angiosperm is an explosion, and you have, you know, explosion of birds, and you have explosion of uh, most of most orders of modern birds. That's an explosion, <coughs> and so you've got uh, in mammals, of course, uh, most modern orders of mammals also you have an explosion. Uh, but um, one of the issues is, uh, w was there life in the Precambrian and the stromatolites uh, issue and so on is, uh, uh, Meyer probably believes, uh, endorses long ages for life. Yes, he does. And so uh, to him that's not an issue, but it is an issue if you... Uh, think in terms of the Precambrian uh, being before creation week or uh, if you say it's after creation week, it doesn't represent uh, very much of the animal life that was created during creation week. Yeah. Uh, so that uh, there's a little bit of tension there. 
uh, which uh, I, I see how he, why he avoids it uh, per se. Uh, I would just add uh, on another line that uh, dealing with the issue of the first life and uh, <coughs> algae and so on in the fossil record that uh, there are several examples coming out of living organisms in deep rocks. And uh, we talked including about Including algae. Oh, yeah, including algae, uh, and I think amoebas, amoebas, and so on. But they, they, they found a worm uh, clear down to three and a half kilometers down in South Africa. A living worm. A living worm. It's a nematode. Uh, it's only a half a meter long. Half a did I say meter? Yeah, you said meter. <laughs> half a millimeter. Half a millimeter long. <laughs> uh, and you know, and uh, much thinner. It's a typical roundworm type of thing, and uh, lives down there at uh, forty-eight degrees centigrade, which is uh, you know marginal for life. <laughs> Kind of warm. Which probably has something to do with the fact that it's only a half a millimeter long. Yeah, well, <laughs> this, so, uh, and uh, in Sweden they found some um, uh, fungi uh, clear down three, four and a half um, kilometers down, uh, excuse me, four to five hundred meters, but they found bacteria. Uh, four to five kilometers down. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and th th this is uh, an issue that Meyer might not raise up, but that uh, one might raise up if you're thinking about a creation model. And that is uh, how many of these early life things are really early because living organisms live there at present. And you don't know when they were fossilized. Uh, it is kind of a, uh, a blot on the scientific community, uh, at least in this area, that uh, if they find a fossil in a Precambrian sediment, they assume that that fossil is the age of the sediment. And uh, this is uh, very easily challenged. Yeah. Just maybe a crazy question. There's been some question raised about some of these fossils, whether they're plant or animal. They could be just plants. Well, could yes, that's true. And one of them even looked pretty vague. I'm just wondering if it's possible that some fossils like that could have been generated by humans, like making something, and then a piece of it, break, they break up, and then it looks like animal, or, and maybe it was human generated, human made. I think most people who look at the fossils would find that a difficult uh, hypothesis to ex accept, certainly. Certainly those who don't believe that humans went back that far would find it very difficult to accept. Um, it's it's a possibility. The only th the only problem that I would have with that is that if you try to figure out it, why would those be the only things that would be found that are human made, uh, you'd expect to find some other implements that are human made besides just those. Um, go ahead, and then we'll come back to you. All right. Uh, once again. Uh, you have made, again, a good case from several books uh, and your own experiences uh, for uh, the uh, paradigm that tries to explain life uh, as being due to chance micromutations acted on by a counter countervalent force of selection of some sort. Uh, 
And clearly, this is inadequate, I think, in explaining the phenomena of zoology, as you've demonstrated, mm -hmm. and as Dr. Roth, Roth, Roth points out, also of plant life. And as I've tried to point out from time to time, if you go back to inorganic nature, uh, we find the same kind of gaps in cosmology that, that create problems. For example, the uh, expansion of the universe discovered by Hubble seemed to explain uh, everything from the Big Bang down to the present. And but then it was too smooth, so we had to invent inflation to make that work. Right. And uh, uh, just the more you see of it now, we need dark matter to make something else work, and we need dark energy to make something else work. And at some right. point, you're starting to think, this but, is sure jury-rigged. But uh, recently, in the last decades of the last century, new findings uh, that the... Uh, rate of expansion, instead of slowing down as the second law of thermodynamics says it should, is accelerating. So they hypothesize the existence of dark energy to a countervalent force to gravity to explain this. And uh, really what seems to be involved here is when we look at the whole universe, living and non-living, there are two basic paradigms that emerge that either or uh, prevails, one is right and the other is wrong, or possibly both are right, but they in some way are intertwined and interact. And one is the idea that chance uh, explains everything that we find. Uh, Lucretius put it very well back at the beginning of Western thought when he said an infinite number of atoms falling through an infinite void for an infinite time, interacting in terms of attraction and repulsion, explain everything there is, including even us and the gods, uh, if there are any. Uh, and that, uh, the Darwin and the neo-Darwinian hypotheses that you've discussed are just refinements on that basic argument. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, through the whole history of Western thought, there's been an also the theory that some kind of order prevails in the universe that's very similar to what we call purpose or intelligence in ourselves. And that this order can be variously conceived. Aristotle called it entelechy. I mentioned last week that Rupert Sheldrake at Cambridge University has come up now with what he calls morphogenetic fields that are exposed to produce things like the phylogenetic tree and apparently, according to the most recent uh, theories that are coming out now with biologists and also with uh, students of intelligence in ourselves, like ourselves, psychologists and micro uh, bio, uh, neurology, you can find sudden emergences of order with nothing predating it of any sort. These can be explained in quite a wide variety of ways. You can explain it in terms of an anthropomorphic God, such as presented in Genesis. Moses sees his backsides, and uh, he walks in the garden and talks with them. You can conceive it in some more abstract way, as many modern theologians do, some kind of field or force of consciousness or intelligence that pervades everything. Or uh, you can even try to explain it as Sheldrake does, in terms of biology as a morphogenetic field. I, I do think that, and I presume you're coming to this, that we would like to investigate some of these various paradigms for order, as well as repudiating the idea that chance can account for everything. I, I think that's fair. Um, let's see. Go ahead and then, Ariel. You know, just a quick question. Some of these pictures that you showed were real blurry samples of some of these really early fossils. How many samples of these things do they have? You know, they're trying to figure out, is this an animal, is this this, is this that? How many samples do they have to look at? Well, um, the only place that I have actual data that, that the book mentions and that is the, uh, I think it was Kimberella, that there were 37 specimens. <coughs> so, you know, are there are there two, are there 20, are there 
200. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's measured in the thousands. Mm -hmm. uh, just to add to the picture, and a couple of questions have arisen earlier. Uh, you need to keep in mind, uh, when I was a student, uh, that was quite a while ago, uh, the Cambrian was defined as no fossils. And this tells you a little bit about how rare fossils are in the Cambrian. Except for the Burgess Shale. Well, that's... Uh, and the, uh, the Qingjiang Bur Burgess, fossils. Did I, say, I said pre-Cambrian. Pre Pre-Cambrian had no fossils. Yeah. It. Burgess Shale is Cambrian. Right. Uh, so that uh, they are extremely rare. Now, the question has come up, uh, how much of these are real fossils? And this is a very intense and important question that is often ignored and should not be ignored. Uh, there's a book over here in Geoscience Library that lists 300 they say Cambrian, mostly pre-Cambrian fossils that they say are pseudo-fossils or dubial fossils. Now, it means they're dubious or they are false. It's, and of course, there's been an intense search for the first life, you know, because you want to find the first life. And Schopf uh, at UCLA here uh, kind of fell into a trap on that one, uh, although he claims he's right. Uh, and uh, but he's not the only one. Uh, Buick, uh, who was at Harvard, I think he's back in Washington. He, he talks about all these false fossils that they have in the Cambrian and the Precambrian. You find a sphere there, and you say, "Hey, that looks like a cell. It's first life. We've got it." You know, hundreds of these things are, f are considered dubious or false. Uh, in the scientific of, literature. Some of them were considered uh, fairly authentic fossils before they fell from grace. Vernon and Malcula being one of them. This, this is, uh, uh, and you know, uh, you find what you look for. And we need to all be careful about this. And uh, if you find it, you get funding for your next three years of field research oh, to find more. Sure, and if you can, uh, if you can give it a big name like the God particle or uh, <laughs> the God gene or something like this, you're more likely to get some money for your for your, for your uh, to pursue your research type of thing. So uh, need to keep this. This is and uh, the area of stromatolites falls into that category. Uh, some very prominent stromatolite. Uh, researchers do worry about the fact, are these things really biological? And then we've got this new uh, wave of uh, mis, which is microbial, uh, in, microbially induced s sedimentary structures, where they think they have layers and they've been induced by, uh, these are areas where you know witchcraft and geology kind of inter intersect, and you, you, you need to you need to be a little cautious about the literature there. I'd like to add a comment in response to your point, and of course you made the same point too that you have to beware of finding what you're looking for. Uh, one of the curious things about quantum theory, of course, is that it seemingly uh, recent work since the uh, early part of the last century, which has been uh, carried on constantly into the present, uh, confirms that consciousness does indeed have a great deal to do with the transformations of potentiality and actual actuality in the field of matter. And uh, depending on the kind of an experiment you set up and the kind of question you ask nature, your purpose, your consciousness as an observer, a particle, a photon in particular, will have li behave like a particle or it'll behave like a wave function. And uh, not only that, but seemingly consciousness can even reverse time. Uh, it can make 
uh, by locality possible. A particle can exist in two places at the same time, or it could move from point A to point B without traversing the distance in between. These curious quandaries of quantum theory uh, have defied any kind of Weltanschauung or rational explanation. Uh, Bohr, with a Copenhagen solution, said don't worry about it as long as it works accurately to one part in 100,000. Let's just go ahead and invent digital cameras and all the things we can with it and don't worry about what kind of a universe makes this possible. But uh, uh, more and more it begins to look like both in uh, physics and astronomy and cosmology and in biology and, and the social and psychic sciences that purpose is a more fundamental element in the working of the universe even than the old-fashioned concept of mecha mechanical causality. Yeah. Uh, yes. There's, there's a um, I, just just a reference. Just to yeah. pursue. There's a common saying in geology that I never would have seen it if I hadn't believed it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bit of humor, which is good. Let me. Uh, well, guess take this up another time. I guess, but we mustn't forget the uh, Schrodinger's cat, and, but I can put also to speak of, and then we're going on to church, and maybe we can pick this up another time, brothers and sisters, uh -huh. uh, the palingenesis, totus Christos of Char Chardin, going for that point. And then we talk about the parousia, I'd like to get into something like this that has to do with the, what's going on now in science and putting it with what we already have in the Bible because it's all there. It's all there. It's just a matter of language, a matter of semantics, and I think that be, it would be a, a very stringent thing if we could do that. We're not disagreeing. We're talking about a modern, this is a, we're living in the two, 2013, <coughs> 2013. And so uh, the, the, the language, uh, we're not talking about a Salem witchcraft or anything mm -hmm. here. We're all in, intelligent and intellectuals, but we don't want to leave, never mind about the God particle or anything like that. I don't even like the way they're putting that. I still say, the heavens declare the glory of God. But what does it say? The firmament showeth his handiwork. Hebrews 1 says, by whom he made the worlds. And who did he make the worlds with? So let us put it together. We're not in this, uh, what we're talking up here uh, uh, earlier about uh, in Genesis, locked in, locked up. No, it's there. I don't like to say a space age, because then that gets us into, oh, well, we're talking about a new age people and all of that. So, no, we have the intelligence, we have the information. I don't want to sound dogmatic. We have, speaking, the Seventh-day Adventists, we're here. Let us go forward with this wonderful information that we have in this book, the Bible. And I want somebody to tell me a little while later that when it says, I, John, saw the holy city coming down from heaven, out of God, from God out of heaven. Tell me where that, where that heaven is. When Jesus ascended, where that is. I look in the Greek. I, I work in the Greek and the Hebrew. So let us, I don't, I'm not diverging. This is Sabbath school. And from a little girl, I know we used to do this. And so I was 86 three days ago. It's my birthday week. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. So and I'm enjoying it. So uh, let, let's... Um, Let's come, let us re really reason together. Appreciate this, this uh, Dr. Paul, Dr. Ariel there, all of us, and my husband, Dr. Yeah. Lee, and myself, Dr. Vivi. I learned my lessons well. So let, let's, let's move on from Dawkins. Why don't they move on? Let's yeah. examine these people, but let's still talk about them. But let's, uh, let's, mm. let's, let's talk about some things that... Yes that would have to do with what's on maybe we think that's on the doorstep if we still believe that uh, Matthew 24. Anybody remember that chapter? Mm -hmm. So thank you.
That'll be an interesting thing to try to put on our profits caps and see where we go from there. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, next week, unless um, something unusual happens, we'll uh, be talking about chapter six and seven. What did you say? Chapter chapter six and seven and of Darwin's Doubt.